Hi, you're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social television magazine that's broadcast in Iran, in English and Persian, via New Channel TV. I'm Maryam Namazi, and I'm presenting this week's program with my fantastic co-host, Fariwaz Puya. Hello. In this week's program, we're going to be speaking about the labels of infidel, of apostate, that we often hear from Islamists, like Mortad, Monafer, and Kafir. And we're going to be speaking about whether these terms and labels should actually be considered hate speech. We think they should, and we're going to be discussing that. We also have an interview with the wonderful Imad din Habib, who started the first council of ex-Muslims in a country where Islam is the state religion. So he'll be talking about that with us later on in the program. And of course, as usual, we will have shocking news of the week, as well as the insane fatwa of the week. We hope you enjoy this week's program. But before we go into the program, let's first listen to a brief clip on what this program is all about. Stay with us. In countries like Iran, those labeled kafar, mortad, monafir, or infidel and apostates, like young Iranian Sohail Arabi, are given death sentences under Sharia law. In the West, though, such intimidating and threatening labels against ex-Muslims, as well as dissidents, free thinkers, and Muslims who don't toe the line, are seen to be a question of free speech. In fact, it is hate speech perpetrated by Islamist hate groups. Now, obviously, freedom of speech and expression are hugely important rights. They're not luxuries. And when we're talking about the unequivocal right to free speech, we're talking about people being able to criticize, poke fun at, even things that are considered sacred. But we're talking about criticism of ideas when we, we talk about freedom of expression. When we talk about criticizing people, it becomes a very different matter. And what we're saying is that very often we find that Islamists incite hatred against ex-Muslims and people who don't agree with them in a way that is often threatening and intimidating. But here, if you go to the police, for example, and say that you've been, you feel threatened because of uh, being labeled kafar or mortad or monafir, the police in Britain, for example, would consider that free speech. It's not free speech, though, and that's one of the points that we're trying to make. And I think um, you're right, because um, terms like kafar, apostates, blasphemer, mortad, um, all of these, because of the political Islamic movement, have grave consequences. Because in Iran, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, if somebody is labelled as kafir, automatically, either through state institutions, or religious groups, or even vigilantes, they would um, be condemned to death and their life would be threatened. So effectively, um, such uh, terms are threat to life. Um, and I think that's what we need to recognize. They are very cl closely related to hate speech. They are violent terms that threaten people's life. So they're not just, uh, you know, innocent um, uh, terms or narratives that people use to um, argue. These are sort of active, uh, um, threatening, violent sort of concepts that need to be very careful, which is totally different from freedom of expression. People have the right to criticize ex Muslims, apostates, uh, um, atheist, uh, Muslim, free thing. That's okay. Criticism is fine. People can have debate, all of those, that's fine. But terms like mortad, monafer, are life-threatening, and I think we need to recognize yeah, that I mean, as it is. Exactly. I mean, I think you have to look at the context as well. The reality is that the very people who are called mortad or monafir or kafir in a place where Sharia law is the law of the land, it means an automatic death sentence If it, you know, with, in these sort of summary kangaroo trials. And in a sense, that same, we all know that Islamism is, a, is an international movement. It does carry out its threats here in the West as well. And these sorts of labels are not, you know, they're not just free uh, terms that are part of free expression. And I'll give you an example of this. For example, we did a report about an Islamist organization here in Britain, the Islamic Education and Research Academy. And we highlighted all this hate speech that they've, you know, they've said against women, against apostates. For example, they say that apostates should be beheaded and beheading is painless, so it's fine. And when 
our report came out, they said, oh, you haven't said anything that we haven't said publicly ourselves. I mean, I'll give you a quote from one of their top people. He said that, oh, yes, you're exposing our open beliefs, which we've never hidden. And because they've been able to hide behind free speech. So on social media, they did a play on my, my name, Namazi, and they said Genazi, which is like a corpse. So quite comfortably and easily, they threaten people in that way. And it's intimidating. It's not like it's just, you know, a form of expression. They're not just expressing their religion. They're an organized hate group. What they, what they say has real implications on people's lives. Absolutely. I think, I think you're right. And they do carry out the threats. There are many people who have been murdered on the streets of Europe. It's not just in Mosul, in Iraq, in Baghdad, in Tehran, and Evin prison, and Pakistan and Karachi. They're everywhere where they have any influence and power, and they have the network, they'll carry out the threats. So it's important to take these matters seriously. There are life-threatening uh, concepts and they have nothing to do with freedom of expression. It's a violent sort of uh, um, method of uh, intimidating yeah, people. Yeah, I mean, definitely. And I think there, there has been a lot of work to recognize, for example, hate speech when it comes to um, hate speech against people of different races, people of different religions. It's high time now that hate speech against people who are atheists and ex-Muslims are also recognized. Let's now go to an interview with Imadi Din Habib, who started the Council of Ex-Muslims in Morocco, and hear about what he faced as someone who came out as an atheist in a country that is very often seen to be quite liberal, and a lot of people go and visit um, as tourists. Let, stay with us and let's listen to his interview. Okay, welcome, Imad um, Eddin Habib. It's wonderful to have you here. You were supposed to speak at the October conference on the religious rights, secularism and civil rights. Unfortunately, your visa was given to you a little too late. But at least you're in London now, better late than never. It's a pleasure to have you here with us. Um, I mean, let me start first. You're one of, uh, you know, you're a well-known Moroccan atheist and an activist and someone who's challenged uh, religious rules for a long time, even before you established the Council of Ex-Muslims of Morocco. Tell us about what it's like to be uh, an Arab atheist in a country where Islam is the state religion. Thank you for the invitation, Mike. It's a pleasure to be in London with you. Um, in Morocco, actually, it's... Um, uh, like um, Morocco, there's no much like religious um, diversity as in other countries, even if it's repressive, even in Pakistan, in Iran, in uh, like Iraq, there is um, more or less religious diversity. There's uh, many branches of Islam. There's many um, Christian and other Jews and other religions or religious communities. In Morocco, there's only Sunni Maliki Islam, which is the state's religion. And I'm, I'm my very tiny minority of Jews, which, like, um, according to say, a less than 6,000 people. And uh, it makes it so hard for people who are different in general, and especially people non-religious and ex-Muslims, to be open about their opinions and to live, uh, um, like, freely and, um, like, um, safely in Morocco if they dared to to be all, like to be open about their opinions, not just on the internet or somewhere, but just to their families, to 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 someone they know, to their friends, and like I, I've got like many stories, many sad stories about people who got harassed by by their their friends, their families, uh, their like peer, like colleagues at work for just expressing just a tiny idea, maybe even. Um, I would say secularism, maybe even like uh, like um, equality, maybe just the, the tiniest idea. So it's really big issue. It's interesting big because, because a lot of times people have this impression that Morocco is quite a, a liberal country and people are quite free there. And, you know, you, you mention how it's actually what, what you've done, you know, is a prosecutable offense in, in Morocco. Explain that. I mean, what's the reality versus the image that a lot of people have? Yes, actually, Morocco like relies mainly on tourism, 
among other things and rely on international like um, recognition and but like in the reality like I, even on the laws like it's 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 punishable to 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 shake a faith of a muslim like it means just if you talk with a muslim why you are a muslim do you think that quran is the word of god it's punishable from like from six months to three years of prison um i just like um, or like it's illegal to form any organization or political party that like um, doesn't consider Islam or the monarchy or the m Moroccanness of Sahara as um, as their like um, as sacralities or, or they just disagree with them, and it's it just. Uh, illegal to to make any posts on the internet or like in the streets or something about like talking about like against like uh, the, like Islam or against the monarchy. So it's it's um, um, it's oppressive, but like in a selectively oppressive. So they don't oppressive like um, uh, anyone who say this, and but like they they do. And like we we witnessed like many arrests of people just for the sake of their opinions. I mean, you, you mentioned also that there are people who you heard from who were atheists who suddenly disappeared and you have no idea what happened to them. Uh, you know, it, it, it's important, I think, for people to realize how difficult it is actually to say that you're an atheist and, um, you know, that it has real repercussions. And also for you, I mean, what happened to you in particular as well? Yeah, I actually, like, um, for, for, like, generally, like, for people, like, um, we, when, like, we are on Facebook or Twitter or any other social uh, media, like, people are with fake names because they can't, like, uh, Moroccans actually are de facto Muslims for the law and de facto Muslims for the family and for other people, like, when you meet a Moroccan, you, like, the first thing he will think about, uh, you're Muslim. So, uh, it's, um, it's an option actually, either like pretend to be Muslim and just um, like, uh, um, like pretend to abide by laws of the country or uh, be open by your opinions and you get harassment from your family, from, from everywhere. Like actually I got like harassment from my family, from society, from where, where I like I, 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 I studied and from like um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of death threats and everything just because I, I was open about my opinions on, on social media and 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 like like it's it's like really sad to, to, to see this. Like people are just pretending to be Muslim just to stay because they have ties in Morocco, because they can't leave Morocco, because they, they love Morocco, they're Moroccan. But still the Moroccan society predominant culture doesn't accept Moroccans as a um, like the, like as a diverse religious communities, but it stipulates that they are either to be Muslims, Sunni Maliki Muslims, or they they not part of this um, Moroccanness, if mm -hmm. we can say. I mean, there was also the the ulamas, the Council of Ulamas issued a fatwa against this. Explain that. What happened exactly? Um, actually, when when we founded the Council of Ex-Muslim, which we was a um, an answer like how we we um, label ourselves because we were like in, in that like uh, as Albert Camus said like when there's uh, when you live somewhere where there's so many chains like to 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 express yourself your own existence become rebellious acts and that was it like Council of Ex Muslims is just um, um, a, a, a pledge to exist we are here we're living here we're Moroccans we uh, and, and we do we do um, um, recognize that we are Moroccans um, and we do not like share the same um, religious affiliations with with the majority and and just later uh, after like weeks after that it was published on on a, on a, 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 a newspaper that the council of uh, the the supreme council of ulamas published a fatwa uh, stipulation that uh, any muslim and actually by seeing muslim in in sunni maliki islam it's anyone born from a muslim father so he's de facto muslim and even if when he grew up and tried to 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 change uh, his religion views he's an apostate for for uh, like uh, uh, for this and any muslim is like uh, if he changed religion, he should be executed and killed. 
and that's like um it's like and and what is funny is is unsaid in the same time it's like uh, this supreme council fulamas is uh, is presided by by the the um, king of morocco and with the um, minister of religious affairs and with the heads of the uh, local um, uh, councils of fulamas like local councils of fulamas so I, it 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 means that the state actually um, gave a reason even for people to to harass you even if they won't kill you actually they will like give people a free pass to harass you and to beat you and to uh, hurt you physically actually which is um, I, I think we could we couldn't like accept it. I mean, what do you say to people who would tell you that you shouldn't have started the Council of Excellence in Morocco, that it was better if you had just stayed quiet and hid your atheism? Well, I think that Europe like relies on all those people who like died and those people who was persecuted from Galileo to Voltaire to to John Jacques Rousseau and other others that like um like they were open about their opinions and th their books were was like burned and they were like killed or burned alive like Bruno and others those ones who created like um um shake, shake the 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 fundamentalism European fundamentalism and I think that that like uh, um the Islamic world needs peoples to shake their fundamentalism and to to come up actually there's there's so many people that like um uh, lost their faith in in the islamic world by it just m like like i would say really difficult for them to come out because like when you come out and they see it's, it's like you you put in mind that maybe one one day you can't live anymore in this country you leave your the loved one you leave everything you love in this country because of your opinions so that's why it makes it so hard for people to come out. Yeah. So do, you, do you regret doing it then, given the fact that you faced so much problems and persecution as a result? Actually, what I regret is the reaction of people. Like, um, I, I know them, um, like, um, religious affiliation is a human right, and anyone is, like, should have the right to, to, to believe what they want, to, to reject what they want. And I think that, like, uh, like the state, the uh, religious, um, um, like um, Supreme Council of Ulamas and the society doesn't doesn't do what what they should do to to promote a culture of diversity in Morocco um, on the Islamic world generally a culture of diversity and a culture of citizenship and what like makes us Moroccans is citizenship and not religious affiliation and not what we eat from what we think about or, or something else. I mean, uh, just as a last question, you mentioned um, the fact that Facebook is one of the only free p places available to a lot of Arab atheists across the world. Uh, why is that? And, um, you know, um, how important has that been in this rise and explosion of atheism that we're seeing across the Middle East, North Africa, and places like Iran as well? Uh, I won't say there's an explosion of atheism in, in in the MENA region, Middle East and North Africa. I would say there's more people who come out from the closet and say, here, I'm not religious, because there have been always people like that, but they, they lack the freedom to, and, and they lack the, maybe the courage, because there's no freedom, but they lack the courage to do so. And we see our brave Egyptian friends harassed and arrested all the time and even like people like Karim Amr like whose family testified against him in a court where he went for five, four years in prison for just being open about his opinions and being critical to the government and to the religion. Actually, I think that Facebook and social media gave um, a free place free from the laws even if actually in Morocco it's, in, it's, um, it's uh, a crime to to criticize monarchy or criticize Islam even on Facebook, but they just like um, apply it from people who are not really known, and we we uh, have no access to know like how many cases were like uh, judged by 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 these articles in law. Actually, unfortunately, but I like there is many many people who are harassed, who are interviewed, who are like visited by secret police because of what well, their activities on Facebook or Twitter or other social media. But like um, in Morocco, it's illegal to form any association 
any political party have any meeting about anything without informing the authorities, without having multiple or infinite um, uh, like uh, like authorizations to to make this. So Facebook is an instant is um, uh, having like an instant effect, an instant impact. It goes viral. It's open to the whole world. That's what make it so powerful, and that what would make it so risky for people who are not like um, with the mass surveillance that applied more more or less in the Islamic world. Yeah. One uh, one last question. I know I said my la the last one was the last one, but what can uh, uh, people do to support atheists in places like Morocco? people like in, in Europe, in Britain? I think that actually um, uh, we should uh, like give those people a chance to live with their, with their religious belief without being harassed, without being concerned about their lives, about um, uh, their, like, um, like we're human beings, like about their basic human human rights, and uh, like and have uh, like have an option to live in that country, to live in their countries, even with the difference of opinions, etc. I think that there's more work to do on the Islamic world to 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 um, uh, to instill um, um, a, a culture of diversity. Of difference and that religious values, um, that individual values, um, enrich the society and not like we, we have in our oppressive societies that the society values that should be applied on everyone. Okay, thank you. I mean, I think you, uh, your case in particular shows how important, how much effect one person can have, and also how important it is, it is to support people like yourself in creating a change. Uh, and helping to create societies where people will be able to say that they're atheists without fear. Thank you, Imad. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Imad Din Habib. I mean, I think one of the major points he raises is the fact that there are there is a lot of pressure, both in places like Morocco, but also in Europe, for us not to say that we've left Islam, that we're ex-Muslims, because they consider it insulting to Muslims. And it shouldn't be that way, because the reality is that people have a right not to believe in religion. They have a right to be atheist. And it's important for them to be able to express that right in the same way that people say that they believe in Islam. Why can't other people say that they don't believe in it? You know, yeah, it's amazing that suddenly, as soon as people leave Islam, it becomes, uh, you know, the intolerance suddenly emerges, and people get upset. People sort of think that you know that they've been insulted by the fact that. But that shows that the, the religion itself is so intolerant; you can't accept any uh, any dissent. Um, and this intolerance not only it's directed towards. Uh, people who leave Islam, but people actually who, within the religion itself, uh, they think different, slightly differently, and I think this is this is a key issue. And I think um, we need to recognise it's extremely hard for people, very brave people, I, I must say, in uh, countries where Islam is the is dominant uh, in social life and has a state power or has very organised sort of linked with, uh, with the state, that becomes really, really th uh, threatening and lives of these people are, is actually is un under constant threat. Um, and uh, there are so many brave, but at the same time, people are very brave. Mm. Uh, there are so many atheists, there are so many people who actually leave Islam on a regular basis or they do, do not adhere to And uh, they to need to religion. be supported. Absolutely. Now, rather than telling people to be quiet, yes. rather than saying don't mention it because you'll offend, you should be saying well done, you should be screaming this from the rooftops. The more people do it, the more comfortable others will feel to do it and the more space will open up for this sort of resistance. And I think what's important is this is not just the right to believe as you want, the right to leave religion. This is a, a, a direct challenge against extremism and Islamism. And I think we have to see 
see this fight also within that larger context. And I think it's very healthy, very healthy to have dissent, very healthy to have uh, beyond dissent. I think it's, it's good for uh, society, for any improvement peop in people's life. We've, I've said this before, you have to have apostasy, you have to be able to criticise. And it's good, the more people question is the better society. Better for everyone. For everyone, for everyone yeah. even for the religion. So I think rather than trying to tell ex-Muslims not to stop saying that they're ex-Muslims, we should actually focus on the Islamists and tell them to stop perpetrating hate against ex-Muslims and everybody else. We've reached the end of this segment though, let's now go to the shocking news of the week. Stay with us. In the shocking news of this week, we are going to be talking about the young Iranian blogger Sohail Arabi, who has faced, who's actually sentenced to execution merely for speaking his mind on Facebook. He has Facebook pages, uh, including one that is uh, against superstition, and he now faces execution as a result. Uh, uh, yeah, absolutely, and he hasn't committed any crime. Punishment of Sohail Arabi is punishment of every single person who has a page on Facebook. I think everybody who is a member of Facebook should actually feel uh, at one with, with Suhail Arabi and need, they need to support him. I mean, there should be a huge camp, international campaign to save his, his life. He hasn't done anything wrong. Yeah, anyone, it could be any one of us. And if we lived in Iran, it could be any one of us or lived in countries under these sorts of really medieval rules. There's a petition that's going to come at the bottom of this page. Please join that petition, sign a petition, do anything you can to defend Sohail Arabi. He hasn't done anything wrong. The crime is actually to execute people merely for speaking their mind. Let's now go to the insane fatwa of the week. In insane fatwa of the week, we thought we'll focus on Christianity because there's a lot of crazy religious people out there and not just uh, Islamists. There's an Arizona pastor, his name is Stephen Anderson, and he's basically come up with the idea that we can get rid of AIDS and have an AIDS-free world by Christmas if only gays were executed. Uh, I mean, this, this is, this is uh, um, um, it's crazy. I think this is exactly the sort of things that the mullahs in Iran, in uh, Saudi Arabia and Egypt regularly uh, um, discuss on TV and they deny the existence of the first thing they do, and the President of Iran did, the existence of the gay people. You know? And that the fact that this uh, uh, gentleman, shall we call him, in Arizona um, sort of uh, demands execution of gay people. That really should be really, really concerning. And you could see that there's so many of these crazy people around. Yeah, I mean, again, this goes back to the whole concept of hate speech, isn't it? It's, it's so easy for people from their religious pulpits and their Friday prayers to make such proclamations that have real impact on people's lives. And I think, you, 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 you know, you shouldn't be surprised that somebody, uh, um, you know, takes that seriously and, um, and takes action against gay people. Yeah. And we see that in the same way that in Iran, when the mullahs from the uh, Friday prayer uh, see, they say that um, people who do not uh, observe Islamic hijab, they are committing crime against God. So a crazy person goes and picks up acid and throws it in the face of a woman. This is exactly the same thing. Yeah. So the, the religious are very intolerant and they need to be stopped. There's a direct link between this sort of hate speech and what happens to people in, in, in their real lives. We've reached the end of our program. I hope you enjoyed this week's program. Of course, we'd love to hear from you. You can send us videos, uh, short video clips, which we could upload and comment on. Please send us ideas on issues and topics that you want us to cover. And also, you can recommend people you'd like us to interview. We'd love to hear more and more from you. It's really, it's helpful, you know, when we're sitting here doing a program, it's lovely to hear people who've watched the program write back to us, contact us, tweet us, uh, comment to us on Facebook because it helps us to try and improve the program so it'll be even better for you. Anyway, we hope you have a wonderful week and until next week, have a lovely time. See you then. Bye. <laughs>